This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Jonathan Gimo, a PhD candidate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. Jonathan, you've been researching prescribing trends in this area for a while. What sort of patterns have you found? So osteoporosis drugs have been a lot more prescribed over the last 20 years. Especially starting in the early 2000s, we look at a really steep increase of prescribing patterns for osteoporosis drugs, and that peaks around 2008, uh, after which we start to see a slight decline until the data I have until around 2012, 2013. And you're talking about specific countries here or the whole world? I'm looking at two countries in particular, England and France. Why do you think there has been this increase? Well, I assume there are many factors influencing this increase in trend, but the major one is an awakening of uh, public health into the issue of fractures in older people and then as a consequence osteoporosis in older people. The other factor that has strongly influenced the increase of prescribing is the arrival of actual options to mitigate osteoporosis on the market around that time of uh, 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 mid-90s. Perhaps we should just get clear what osteoporosis is. Osteoporosis is the embrittlement of bones and it's usually associated with age. It means as such that you are at increased risk of fracturing if you fall or if you have a a low trauma in your daily living. And it's only recently that there have been medical treatments that are effective? It's only been recent that there is evidence about that they are efficient. There has been One drug arrived on the market, but it had a very low uh, uptake. There is another reason for this drug not to have much uptake, is that this period of medical history was strongly influenced by hormonal replacement therapies, which were uh, heavily given to uh, women. Until the end of the 90s, when there was the Women Health Studies that proved an association between hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer. Why would this pattern of prescription of hormone replacement therapy affect what happened with osteoporosis? Hormone replacement therapy was given to uh, women as an overall solution to uh, older age issues in women, among them the lowering of uh, bone mineral density. Was it effective? From the data I have, it was effective. Well, it was greatly effective. The only issue was that a lot of women would get breast cancer, which is a side effect that was largely ignored for a long time until this woman health uh, study that really changed the people's views on the issue of hormone replacement therapies. And then when did another effective treatment of osteoporosis kick in? That happened a bit before uh, the, the change of views on hormonal replacement therapy. The big change came in 1995 with the arrival of alendronate on the European market. Presumably this was a drug that was patented by the pharmaceutical industry. Yes, it was. And it had the strong asset of providing hard evidence showing that this drug increased the bone mineral density and therefore helped uh, older people with fractures. Now you're comparing France and England in prescribing policies. What are the factors that make these two countries different? In terms of prescribing trends, from what I've looked at, there is one key difference is the diversity of prescribing in France compared to England. The England market for osteoporosis drugs is a lot more homogeneous than the French market. Overall, they prescribe quite the same, so they had that same steep increase from the early 2000s until 2008, and they seem to have the same pattern of decrease since 2008. So a number of things going on there. By diversity, you mean there were a range of treatments that were used by different doctors? Over the years, uh, several drugs entered the market. I think at the moment there are more than 10 on the market. In France? In both France and England. Where we see the difference is that alendronate makes up more than two-thirds of the English market, while it makes less, about a third in France, 
and the rest of the market is uh, taken by the uh, broad diversity of, of drugs, not a second key drug. And why do you think that is? From the policies that I've been looking at, so I've been looking at official documents, and it seems that official guidelines published both by England and France, and that are clearly different, have had a strong impact on the way prescribers have given the drugs to patients. And in England, NICE clearly states that alendronate is the number one choice for the management of osteoporosis, while uh, the HAS, the French equivalent to NICE, only lists the possible uh, options without ranking them. Why don't they rank them? Because presumably there must be evidence that some treatments are better than others. My understanding is that in France there is a choice to give doctors the possibility to select the drug that best fits the purpose in their patients. There is clearly that choice also in England, but there is the influence of costs and of cost-effectiveness of drugs, which is not as applicable to France at the moment, which has encouraged a ranking, the number one being the most cost-efficient drug and the last one being the least cost-efficient. That's really interesting. So that actually, are you saying that in France, a doctor could choose to spend more money on maybe a less efficient drug because he or she felt that that was the correct drug to use in a particular case? I would go further than that. Usually doctors don't know how much drug costs. So in England, they will use the ranking that is best fit as per the guidelines, whereas in France, they would choose which one they find it best. But from the interviews I've had with doctors, very few of them knew actually the prices of the drugs they were prescribing. So really, there's very different models of how the state intervenes in the process of uh, prescription. I wouldn't say widely different, because eventually... The management of osteoporosis is quite similar, although the drugs are quite different, but they are choosing a slightly different way of, of prescribing, less intervening in France, more intervening in England. I suppose you could say that the French doctors are given a lot more freedom of choice about how they deal with the particular case. Yes, I believe this is something that's going to change over the years, but at the moment there is more freedom in France than in England in terms of prescribing. Are there other important factors which determine the prescription practices with osteoporosis? I'm sure there are a number of factors that influence the prescribing of of doctors. I look only at two categories, which are first the behaviours of doctors, so how they feel about prescribing on the basis of what they choose to prescribe, so that's on an individual basis, and I I look at this in a qualitative manner, and also I look at policies, whether they are uh, official guidelines, uh, market entry of drugs, or new uh, indications for drugs. That's one way of looking at it. And then there might be many other factors influencing prescribing. We could imagine that marketing, although it's less and less true considering the, the, the decrease of the influence of the pharmaceutical industry over prescribing of doctors, but it still has, one way or another, an impact. So we've talked a bit about different policies between France and England in relation to prescription. Are the different styles of being a doctor, do you think, in those two countries? I would say that there is more diversity between doctors and between both countries. Obviously, there are several uh, specialties of doctors that prescribe osteoporosis drugs. And there are styles of generations, for example. Newer doctors, I find, are a lot more likely to abide by rules given by health authorities, while older generations will stick to uh, their freedom of prescribing. It's interesting to consider different ways of doing things in different countries. Is what you're doing with your research a kind of history of medicine, or is it something else? It is both. Uh, There is an objective of uh, history here. We are looking back in time to link doctors' behaviours, but essentially policies, with prescribing trends, which is intrinsically you know, historical work. But then there is also the goal of informing policymakers at the moment to see how 
osteoporosis is handled in two different countries and the links with actual prescribing trends. So that might be an interesting tool for policymakers in order to develop more precise, more specific policies in the future. If I've understood you correctly, you said that in France, the doctors can prescribe a range of different drugs without any intervention from the state. In Britain, it's more, more difficult if you go away from the number one choice. You have to have a reason because as NICE has given clear guidelines on what the most cost-effective drug in this area is. If you had to choose between those two models, which one would you say is preferable? I would imagine that if you want a really rational, really effective system, the British system tends towards a more cost-effective uh, healthcare system. But it depends on the quality of the evidence we have. And uh, I think that's a real work that needs to be done in the very near future on how to make sure that what we give actually is efficient to populations. So data was very based on clinical trials. Uh, but in risk factors, in analyzing the possibility of a risk factor turning into a real problem, so in that case here, the difference between having osteoporosis and actually sustaining a fracture, since it's a rare event, a clinical trial is not the best solution to see efficacy. Because even if you have 2,000 patients included, which is a very large clinical trial, you may have a limited number of fractures eventually. So to be able to see if the drug was really efficient it requires a large number of patients. So observational studies in the future, so looking at patients being prescribed right now on their daily living, might provide real solutions in the future to be able to assess drugs a lot more effectively than they are assessed at the moment. Jonathan Gimo, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.